Thank you, Andrew, for the nice introduction, and uh, Steve for the invitation. I'll be talking about um, gross recovery in Africa, uh, what the current trends are, and uh, what might uh, the future prospects be. I'll uh, be talking uh, on five points. First, an overview of the recent gross trends. Second, uh, Andrew already uh, uh, pointed to that, the implications of the uh, uh, double crisis uh, on food markets and financial markets. And I'll uh, address a little bit uh, the emerging uh, changes in terms of policy and strategy uh, in Africa, which should uh, shape the future of the recovery process. And then uh, perhaps look at a couple of challenges that I think needs to be um, uh, uh, addressed uh, in order to sustain and accelerate the uh, ongoing recovery process. So to the first point, um, a graph I've uh, shown perhaps too many times, uh, but uh, it, it is a graph that uh, a lot of people had difficulty with at the beginning uh, when I started uh, showing it. Uh, I think it is now accepted that um, um, Africa has turned uh, a corner, I guess. We could go back all the way to the 60s, and what happened since the mid-90s is the longest sustained period of economic growth, both agriculture and uh, GDP in Africa. And uh, what I will do in the rest of my presentation, uh, part of it at least, is to uh, discuss with you what uh, the factors might be that are behind uh, what we're seeing uh, right now. Uh, it was very uh, early on actually noticeable that things were changing. Uh, I remember back in 1996 when I was uh, teaching at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, I organized a conference in 1996 on the same topic, uh, economic recovery in Africa, because all the fundamentals were changing then uh, in Africa. We didn't have uh, the long track record of data to show that, but one could see that there was something uh, on the horizon. Now, uh, what is interesting this time again as well is just not that the period of recovery is long and sustained, but also it's really spreading geographically. I'll comment very quickly on these two uh, uh, maps. The first on the left shows uh, the uh, average gross rate uh, for individual countries in Africa uh, over the 90s, and the darker the color, the higher the gross rate of that country. Now, if you compare the two maps, you have more countries with darker colors in the, second map, in the second map than in the first, which means that more countries are growing at higher rates uh, in the, uh, since the turn of the millennium. Uh, we always had countries in Africa that grew faster than others and really could grow, but we never had such a large number of countries growing at such uh, high rates for such a long period of time. So therefore, there's something that's happening. Uh, the fundamentals must be different this time around. And uh, this is also, I think, the first time that you could go over half a decade and have African countries' export performance uh, being stronger than the world average. We haven't had that either. Uh, maybe you'll look back to the 60s to find that out. But the turn of the millennium was, I think, a time when things really started changing and changing strongly uh, in Africa. The two graphs are showing the gross rate of uh, exports uh, in Africa compared to the world, both in terms of value and in terms of volumes. In both cases, uh, over the five-year periods, the first half of this millennium, uh, the uh, uh, gross rates were above the uh, uh, rest of, of the world. I would like to extend the series. I uh, wanted to use the same source of data, so for comparability, but they haven't come up with that yet. Uh, UNCTAD uh, and um, uh, WTO were the ones who actually who brought the uh, original data. I hope they're going to update it very sometime soon so we can continue the series. Uh, what are the factors behind the gross recovery? Uh, I didn't go into uh, complicated econometric analysis or modeling, but I just looked at a few things. Often people say, well, maybe it's because you know, world markets uh, are behaving differently, prices are higher, and African countries are facing uh, a much more uh, conducive international uh, trading environment. Others say maybe it's, it's the climate, rains have returned to Africa, and things like that. And I've looked at those two things. Uh, and the reason why I did that, actually, uh, it's a very simple comparison, but it's telling. Uh, I looked at the last 40, 50 years, and I said to myself, is there anything that has changed at any given time that has affected all African countries to generate such a broad response and positive across the countries? 
we had good rains and bad rains, good world market conditions and bad world market conditions, but did we have at a single period in time a response that was broad and shared and strong and positive? And if you look at the trends in world commodity price indices uh, from the 1980s to 2011 with projections, and you do the same thing with the rainfall, there is nothing extraordinary that should explain the recovery process we're witnessing right now. What I personally do believe, and I think it can be shown, uh, we see announced, is that the deep and strong and yes, painful and messy economic reform programs of the 80s have turned the situation around in Africa. It is very controversial. My colleagues in Africa don't want to hear that. Uh, and some other people also don't because there's an ideological issue. Uh, there is also just remember the pain of it and the messiness of it. But the uh, reforms that took place have changed the environment for agriculture and for the economies in general. I just have here one very simple indicator to look at that, uh, the rate of inflation and, and, and the way it has changed before, during, and after the social adjustment policies. And you can look at everything around the economies, the exchange rates, you look at uh, fiscal balances, you look at monetary policies, you look at government interventions. Uh, some of us who have been dealing with markets in Africa in the 80s will remember times when you could not move a bag of maize from one place to another in Kenya, when prices were being fixed, when farmers were getting only 30% of export prices, and a lot of other things. Okay? So I think that the change in the economic environment has uh, put the African economies on a totally different path of course. Now, what will be the implications of the change in global food markets? Uh, we all know these uh, pictures. Uh, unfortunately, it's been used uh, to uh, uh, perpetuate, I think, uh, the thinking and the consensus about doom and gloom around the world. And it was funny. When prices were low, people were complaining that African countries were not making money and prices are high, they're complaining that African countries are suffering from it. Mm -hmm. So it cannot be both. It has to be either or. Uh, or perhaps uh, it's a matter of magnitude. I don't know. But what is important here is that what happened in 2008 uh, was an aberration. may happen again, but it's not a depiction of what the long-term price trends are going to be. I uh, have other data that would show that most African countries actually were not affected by these price increases, a much, much lower level of price increases. You look at West Africa in general, Africa in general, if you take out rice and wheat, uh, prices were much more moderate in terms of the increases. You look at West Africa, the price levels at the peak of the crisis were similar to the prices in 2005, just three years prior. But then, nobody was going around talking about uh, increasing child mortality, increasing hunger, and what have you. Okay, so there was a little bit of, a lot of a hype, actually, not a little bit, around the increase in, in, in prices. Uh, I'm not uh, belittling uh, what it did. I'm also not ignoring that it can happen again, because the factors behind the price hike are still around, and that can come back again. But uh, I think a more realistic outlook for prices in the world market uh, a smoother trend. Um, we can discuss uh, the factors underlying this as well, but uh, uh, prices will go up in the future. We may have these blips and uh, these flare-ups due to speculations and other things, but the trends are certainly going up. We should be actually um, uh, positive for African countries. The reason why it should be positive is that uh, we all know that productivity in Africa has been low for a long time. Uh, there are signs that uh, perhaps uh, there will be improvements uh, on that front as well. Uh, we have on the left-hand side here uh, uh, total factor productivity uh, in African agriculture, trending up slowly uh, since the mid-80s and going up as a yellow curve in the bottom. Uh, we have, uh, I think, global agriculture having some difficulty sustaining growth and productivity. This may change now because of the response to the uh, global food uh, price crisis. I think uh, Asian countries, in particular India and China, are doing a lot to return agriculture to growth. But those countries will face some difficulties related to availability of labor, of water, of land, and what have you. So I think that if African countries can sustain the return to higher productivity, they'll have a very good position uh, to compete uh, in the future. The uh, long-term trends in high food prices and agricultural prices in general should be uh, uh, um, a, uh, an opportunity for African countries. Uh, they have a larger potential in terms of raising productivity and competing than the rest of the world in general. 
due to a lot of other dynamics, uh, such as what I just mentioned in China and, and in India. Uh, the uh, financial markets uh, have affected certainly what uh, the recovery process has been in Africa over the last 10-15 uh, years through different channels, uh, recession in importing countries and the impact on export demand, the impact on terms of trade arising from that which affect ag revenues, export revenues in, in particular for the economies but also for exporters and farmers. Uh, the um, uh, crisis as well has uh, um, created a liquidity trap around the banking sector in general around the world which also affected the banking sector in Africa. It has led to uh, uh, lower remittances. Uh, my fellow Senegalese, who is a, um, a limousine operator in DC who just dropped me at the airport, was telling me that he's making now barely 50% of what he did about two years ago. And he told me he was sending about $5,000 every two weeks home. And that's what he's making for a whole month right now. So, and he's certainly not the only one. Uh, but what we have seen, uh, numbers that I uh, haven't, I don't have in my presentation is that remittances are even much more resilient uh, going to Africa. Probably it's a cultural issue that people are tightening their belt but sending more still uh, back home. Uh, but trade credit is a real issue uh, and uh, we'll see uh, the impact of that uh, on, on the growth process. Uh, the availability of foreign exchange and uh, the uh, um, uh, fiscal deficit uh, resulting from the fact that government had to respond to the crisis while they're taking in less revenue also will affect the, um, um, the, um, uh, the recovery process to the extent that it, uh, uh, as much as it would affect uh, expenditure and investment in agriculture. And finally, um, an often cited uh, factor related to the crisis that may affect uh, future growth in Africa is uh, uh, domestic and assistance policy responses, uh, not just within Africa but outside of Africa. Um, I do hope that the um, emerging trends towards um, higher protectionism, especially among emerging economies, uh, that uh, those will be controlled in the future because those are the future markets for African exporters really. Uh, the more they uh, move towards protectionism, the more they'll be taking uh, uh, some of the opportunities away from African countries. Uh, Four uh, quick sets of graphs here. Um, what I would like just to highlight is that um, you look at the food and commodity uh, uh, prices and you look at the export uh, prices on the other hand, it looks like the recovery on the export markets, uh, on the export commodities is much stronger in terms of prices. Uh, the uh, whoop, prices here are picking up much faster after the crisis than prices here. Uh, which could be actually a good sign, uh, meaning that exports might be growing faster uh, than import expenditures would be, given that most African countries are net food importers. So the import products, the prices of the imports are growing, are recovering from the prices uh, much uh, uh, less, uh, much strong, much less stronger than the export prices. I should say here that. What happened here in the blip is that we had the food crisis with prices going up and we got the financial price and prices went back down. So some of them are going up again. And that's where the export commodity prices are faring a little bit better than the um, uh, uh, um, import uh, prices as far as African countries are, are concerned. If this should continue, I think it will be good for the export sectors. Uh, and the growing uh, import food prices still also is going to be good because it uh, creates an opportunity for the local uh, farming uh, sector to um, uh, um, uh, produce more for the domestic markets. A more serious issue here, or equally serious, is the impact of trade finance. And some of my colleagues uh, did some simulations. They look at the um, uh, access to trade finance and how it affected the growth process. And here you have the yellow line is that the decline uh, uh, in demand and how it affects exports in Africa. And in addition to the demand effect, if you factor in the uh, uh, restriction to access to trade finance, for example, you have a much more stronger impact on, on the export uh, um, um, recovery uh, in general. This is overall export, not agriculture. And what they did is that they looked at a much more severe, because it's very hard to predict how severe that will be at the end of the day, and say if the severity would go more than two and a half times stronger, the level of severity, than what they have observed uh, in terms of restriction to access to trade finance because it's getting 
either more expensive to access to the trade or just banks are not lending anymore, that you have a much stronger dip in export demand, uh, in export growth, and a much stronger slow recovery. That is, on the left-hand side here, the overall exports. And when you look at agriculture, it is less pronounced than overall exports, but access to trade finance is going to have a very strong impact on growth performance in the future. Uh, and nobody knows how it's going to shake out now, what's happening in the banking sector uh, after the U.S. now in the EU. But this is no question it's going to affect the recovery process. Uh, foreign direct investment uh, is uh, another area. It's been resilient. I uh, had numbers showing how much uh, stronger they have been. There was a blip about a year or so, but most projects are back on track again. And FTA has grown very, very strongly over the last few years. But what I just wanted to uh, highlight here is that the, now the really strong relationship between agriculture and FDI in Africa, so which is part of the, uh, uh, I think, greater uh, uh, integration of the African economies uh, into the global economy. So their vulnerability, to the financial crisis is stronger now than it has been probably or would have been 30 years ago due to the openness to FDI. Uh, Development assistance has a very um, uh, uh, interesting story uh, as far as it is related to agricultural growth in Africa. And therefore, it's very hard to say how much uh, the crisis and the impact on development assistance is going to affect agriculture. Perhaps I shouldn't say this now in the UK where people are thinking about saving and uh, they may think that it wouldn't matter much if they would um, uh, cut a development assistance. Uh, but I guess my story is going to be a little bit more nuanced than that. When you look at the decade of the 70s, development assistance did really have a positive relationship uh, to, Afri to agricultural growth. Uh, the uh, relationship was uh, already turning negative in the 80s and certainly in the 90s. It's coming back a little bit in, since the uh, uh, beginning of the millennium. What I think is that the, um, um, uh, the policy environment has changed so that development assistance can have a bigger return and a bigger impact uh, in Africa right now. Uh, so uh, it has not made that big difference in the past, especially uh, since the 80s, but it's returning hopefully to what it did in the 70s, having a much more stronger relationship. Uh, the uh, African economies did suffer from the financial crisis, uh, like uh, um, a lot of other economies around the world. Uh, the current account balances, which are positive, dipped into negative territory. Uh, same with the overall fiscal balances uh, around the crisis. Uh, inflation uh, and uh, external debt as uh, uh, share of uh, uh, GDP also uh, suffered a little bit. Uh, but um, uh, inflation itself did not really increase that much. Uh, private financial flows uh, remain very resilient, actually, and are picking up again uh, in 2010. Uh, as a result, uh, Africa fared actually uh, better than the rest of the world during this crisis. It was much more resilient. Uh, the growth rate remained positive and is picking up. And I think projections now coming from OECD and coming from the IMF are that uh, growth rates are going to be quite strong uh, uh, into next year, over 4%. Uh, the uh, uh, ag policy development in Africa, which will be uh, shaping the future of the recovery process. Uh, many of you are familiar with them. I'll go very quickly uh, 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 in talking about it. Uh, you've heard about the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program and what it's trying to do uh, around Africa to uh, uh, develop, uh, to address strategic issues around agriculture, uh, figure out what the success factors are that countries can be uh, 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 relying on to uh, sustain the recovery process, best practices, and policy elements for successful uh, uh, strategies. Uh, they are working around uh, long-term investment options, uh, agreeing at the country level uh, in terms of commitments on sector policies, budgetary policies, development assistance, and policy dialogue. And uh, I think for the first time, uh, developing a uh, continent-wide framework for benchmarking, peer review, and mutual learning and all these three things are gearing towards uh, creating an environment uh, in Africa where you have sh a shared long-term framework for action, uh, where you have a framework for development partnership and accountability, but also moving more towards evidence and outcome-based planning and implementation. And I think this is going to 
shape the environment, if it is really implemented successfully and sustained, it would uh, uh, allow an environment with better policy growth, poverty, and food security outcomes. Um, let me skip this one and then uh, talk about something that is much more, uh, uh, I think, uh, important going forward. It is how to meet the double challenge of bridging the growth gap to accelerate poverty reduction. We know that growth has returned in Africa, but we know that most African countries won't be meeting the Millennium Development Goal uh, of halving poverty in 2015. There's been just uh, uh, too much of a stagnation at the beginning. They started really making some progress uh, in the second half of the 90s. Uh, what we have here is um, the first line in red is the poverty rates of 1990 uh, for a subset of African countries, and the blue line is where they need to be by 1990, I'm sorry, by 2015, if they were to meet MDG1. Um, and the blue bars are the projected poverty rates if agriculture continued to grow by 6% in those countries. So some will meet the MDG, but several here would still be above the um, uh, MDG mark. Mm -hmm. So uh, the challenge of getting, uh, sorry, accelerating poverty reduction is one, not just because some countries growing at 6% sustaining is very tough, but even if they did, some still will have a problem uh, uh, having poverty. Uh, but what is even more important is that you look at the blue line, you're really talking about poverty rates of still around 30%, even if they did meet MDG1 by 2015, which is still quite high. So whatever you can get there for in Africa in terms of reducing poverty and linking it more to growth, I think uh, one will have to go for that. Uh, more importantly, uh, the expenditure gap to accelerate growth. Uh, these 6% growth rate and the green bars, to achieve them in these countries, will require double-digit growth rate in agricultural expenditure, the yellow bars. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to get that money to do that? It's going mm -hmm. to be very tough. So the challenge is, yes, you have a recovery, but to really make a big and lasting and substantial impact on poverty, you're asking for more than most countries can deliver right now, not in the short run, probably by 2025, 2030, but not by 2015, certainly. And what that means is that uh, if you don't have enough money to finance growth in agriculture, you have to make sure that every penny that the government spends contributes to reducing poverty to the maximum it should. And that's why we think and if prey on what we call the gross poverty convergence agenda. It is how do you uh, go away from looking at money going into health, education, and social safeness as being lost to agriculture to a mindset where you see how you can maximize and optimize the resources going to education, health, and safety net for agriculture. Mm -hmm. To get the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Finance, not to look at, at, its, at each other as competitors for the same resources, but as uh, 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 cooperators uh, and negotiating not how much money goes to health or education, but how the money going to health and education can be used to optimize the impact on, uh, on, uh, on, on agricultural growth and labor productivity. We do know that those are related in the long run, that education in the long run impact on labor productivity. We do know that health does. But are there opportunities to, to maximize that impact in the shorter run? And I think they are, and that's what we're trying to look at. And the way we uh, did this is to look at health, education, and safety the same way we look at infrastructure. Uh, nobody says that uh, uh, any more infrastructure is good for growth or for agriculture. We make a distinction between highways, small secondary roads, rural roads, tracks and trails, and market infrastructure. So we're not treating infrastructure as the homogeneous uh, uh, good anymore in terms of affecting growth. We know that different types of infrastructure have different implications for growth in the rural areas. And we are saying, and we're trying to test this, that different services, subtypes of health services, and different subtypes of education services affect agriculture more than others. So when we talk about money going to health and education, as a government, you should look at which types of subservices in those uh, sectors have the biggest impact on uh, agricultural labor productivity. So you can amplify the relation between growth uh, and uh, expenditure in those areas. We looked at uh, health here in, um, in the case of Uganda. We didn't have really good numbers on uh, uh, education in uh, Africa. We looked at uh, Vietnam. Uh, you look at the two graphs, um, if one just look at the impact of health uh, on labor productivity in, rural, in Uganda, uh, a 10% increase in service expenditure on health would raise efficiency uh, in agriculture by 0.07. But if you look at 
a composition of health expenditures where you focus more on malaria, you will raise efficiency by double. And the reason for that is that there are diseases in the rural areas that affect uh, labor availability during peak labor seasons more than others. And you have a service delivery system that uh, addresses those labor diseases, you have a different productivity profile and a different growth rate in the longer run uh, in those countries. Uh, and the probability of being poor and how it's affected by uh, different uh, uh, diseases is shown in the same graph, uh, minus 1, minus uh, 0.11, and minus 0.23 in the case of, um, yeah, I'll wrap up quickly, in the case of um, uh, 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 health in, uh, in, in Uganda. I'll discuss a little bit more when we, when we discuss that uh, in the discussion round. I'll just skip it. But the notion is we should go away from looking at health as just health having an impact on agricultural growth in, and then look at health as a composite of subtypes of services which do affect labor productivity differently and therefore raising the possibility of optimization. Same with education, same with social safety net. So the basic strategic question you're facing if you're an African country you cannot have enough resources to finance growth, to reduce poverty much faster than you need to do, then you should ask yourself, how do I maximize the long-term growth while meeting short-term social needs in the social sectors? How do I maximize the synergy between social services and productivity enhancing investment? And how do I exploit the gross neutralities of social services? How to improve, therefore, the consideration of these synergies in budget planning and negotiation? So let me then now go quickly, Andrew, to the conclusions. Um, we have seen a remarkable recovery uh, in Africa, but it could not compensate uh, the two and a half decades of economic stagnation prior. So that is the real story and the bottom line. We still have large pockets of poverty, uh, progress towards the MGD is picking up, but the pace is just not enough uh, to get most countries there. So we need, therefore, to accelerate and broaden the recovery process we've seen over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, the global crisis are a threat, but also full of opportunities for African economies. Uh, they have shown greater resilience than during past crises. I have a nice graph showing how the different oil crises and recessions and other things affected growth in Africa and how um, things are totally different right now. African agriculture is indeed well positioned to compete uh, and benefit from long-term global price trends. Uh, we have seen an unprecedented uh, Africa-wide effort to reform policies and strategies in Africa. That wasn't the case actually a decade ago. The recovery of the last 15 years has created a very strong foundation, I think, that African economies can build upon. We have today better conditions for higher returns investment and development assistance, I need to say that, than any time before, perhaps in the 60s. Uh, we have a, a unprecedented efforts uh, to improve policy planning, to raise government investment in agriculture, and to sustain uh, and deepen the recovery process. So these should be, I think, uh, much more hopeful times uh, than uh, we have had ever before in the past. Thank you. Thank you.